Hello, my name is Carl Zangro, and uh, my colleague uh, Ed Powers and I want to welcome you to this third module of our on-demand effective crisis communication program. And um, you know, I'm going to let Ed I'm gonna pass it over to you to kind of just recap briefly what we covered in modules one and two, and uh, then we'll move into module three. Thanks, Carl. Well, welcome back, everyone. And so in our first module, we did a overview of what is crisis communications and how to think about it in terms of framework. Then in the second module, we shifted over to focus in on stakeholders and the various stakeholder groups that are just critical to communicate with during a crisis. In this third and final module, we're going to um, delve into the other two aspects of the what I call the communications triangle. So stakeholders is one. Two and three are the messages you send and the channels you use to send them. So that's what, that's what our focus will be in this module. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, we, we spent a lot of time in module two talking about stakeholders and a little bit around in module one around preparing uh, for, for a crisis situation. And certainly stakeholder analysis is part of that preparation. Hopefully you've done some of that uh, before a particular crisis uh, may hit. You know, once it does hit, once, once you're facing a crisis situation, how does an organization know what to say? Uh, you know, and here is often a challenge, right, Ed, that we don't always know all of the facts right when the crisis emerges. So what do we do? It's uh, absolutely the case that um, more often than not, there's, um, there are gaps in, in what we know. And so the potential for misinformation is, is high. So that means, uh, Carl, that the main mission in the early stages, and I'm talking about the, the first few hours after a crisis hits, is clarity and accuracy. Now there's um, um, a specialist whose name is Dr. Vincent Cavello. Um, he's from the Risk Institute, uh, uh, Risk Institute, excuse me, Management of Risk Institute. And um, he's come up with a message map that has a handy rule of three. And what, what that refers to it is that he describes you should have no more than three messages taking no more than nine seconds each and in total having no more than 27 words. And let me give you a quick example of how, how this might play out. Again, keep in mind that this is in the very early stages. So suppose you have a active shooter situation in a local high school and you work in communications PR for the school system. So the initial messages, messages in those first couple of hours as this thing is unfolding might be, um, Gunshots have been heard within the school. Local police are on site and have entered the building. And teachers and students go through periodic training about how to shelter in place. So you're providing some basic facts about what's known at that period of time, not speculating about things like um, have any injuries occurred uh, or other details of, of what might be transpiring. So during um, this early stage, that type of accuracy um, and, and focus on uh, the clarity is, is critically important. So you really don't want to include in that early message uh, information that you can't verify, right? I mean, you really need to feel confident that what you're communicating is accurate because you don't later on want to have to kind of correct that message or say, gee, you know, we made a mistake. So it's better to go out early with the information that you were really confident about. Is that fair to say? Absolutely on, on the mark. And it's one's counter to many leaders, uh, but a key phrase in the early stages is to answer questions with, we don't know yet. And um, as information becomes available, again, whether it's in the first few hours, the first day, the first two or three days, you start to fill in, fill in those gaps. But you actually establish credibility 
by acknowledging that you don't have all the information and you, and you're, you establish very quickly, you're not going to speculate as to what may be occurring. So, so essentially, you, you, you have to be agile in terms of the, the messaging and how it evolves over time. Is that true? I mean, how, how does it often occur as, you know, time transpires, whether it's a few minutes, a few hours, a few days, how does the messaging typically evolve? It's um, so that first phase of accuracy, uh, focusing on accuracy and um, and clarity, uh, evolves into so what is uh, the company doing in terms of, of its response? So you get into more of a shaping and influencing of the message, the communication going out, and so in doing so, the company, the organization, is describing its position relative to the crisis, the unfolding crisis uh, uh, that is taking place. And in doing so, the objective becomes um, messages that your key stakeholders will hear, remember, and ideally even be able to repeat, okay, over, over a period of time. So again, it's now starting to shift to how do I think about the organization and it, its response, which is a combination uh, Carl, as you've pointed out in our previous discussions, it's a combination of what you say, but just as critically what you do, which leads to a, a, a couple of important uh, caveats I'd like to share. One is um, what I call the three C's. The spokesperson for the organization um, should, be, uh, should, uh, should be in control of the situation. Okay, so they, um, it can be easy to uh, particularly with questions being fired at you from various uh, media outlets uh, to the confusing situation that might exist. It can be e easy to be thrown off kilter, but maintaining control is important. Having credibility, the second C, is, is important as well. You don't want to, the organization just shouldn't put just anyone out there. You need someone that has the credibility of, I can represent this organization and I can talk as meaningfully as possible at this stage about what, what is happening. And that leads into the third C, which is compassion. Um, crises involve people, um, harm to people, to property. And so the aspect of being compassionate and recognizing that that harm has occurred uh, is important as well. The other important caveat is um, one we've talked about previously, which is again, actions have to match words. There's a temptation as um, in communicating to try and promise people things that uh, you, you very much hope will occur in terms of the crisis being resolved, but it's important to stay within the boundaries of what is actually likely, likely to happen. Because if your actions don't match up with the expectations that you're, cre you're creating, your credibility and your reputation are gonna suffer. Yeah, you know, I remember in module one, we talked about the fact that uh, reputation management is the flip side of crisis communication and crisis management. And uh, that it really ne necessity to make sure that actions reflect the words, the messaging that's been sent out there is just, just so important. I remember looking at a Edelman Trust Barometer Edelman is a, a global uh, PR firm, and they have this uh, survey they do periodically to, to measure the trust that brands have. And repeatedly, it's very clear from the people responding to the survey that they really pay attention to the actions of organizations, not just the words. And reputation ultimately uh, lives or dies based on on that action, uh, and, and that goes to your other point. It's it's risky to overpromise uh, in a crisis situation. Be realistic, and um, make sure again that the actions uh, reflect the words, the messaging that's gone out. And so now we have the message. We've crafted the message. We're early on in the crisis. Uh, how do we deliver messages? What, what, what delivery mechanisms should we be thinking about? The simple answer to the delivery question, Carl, is you use your existing channels. 
Um, one quick thing to point out right at the start in talking about this subject, a crisis is not the time to try and develop and implement a new communication channel. You have to use that which you're already using and you're, com and you're confident in. Now, having said that, um, crises uh, by definition present special circumstances, circumstances and, and situations. So one of which is those existing channels may not be available. Um, take take uh, as an example, say there's a major hurricane that blows through the area, knocking out uh, power and disrupting uh, communications lines in the area. So for both you as the organization, as well as the people you're trying to reach, um, the normal communications may not, may not be available. So that has to be a part of the, of the planning process. Uh, so that's one. A second consideration is that um, the, depending on the nature of the crisis, people may not turn to you for the information, at least not first. So you'll have to go and inform others. Example here, suppose you work for a, a manufacturing company in the chemical industry. So you operate chemical plants. Suppose there's an explosion. Well, the local community, which becomes a critical uh, stakeholder in that circumstance, is likely to turn to uh, police and fire locally, uh, town and city officials first, to ask, what's going on? What should I do? How much of a risk uh, does this uh, explosion present? Okay, so keeping those folks informed is more important than actually trying to, uh, to reach the, the community itself. Finally, um, the other consideration is that emergency channels may come into play, sort of these rarely used, but highly effective when they're needed. Think of the example of uh, going back to an active shooter, but maybe in this case, it's say it's on a college campus. The college may ha um, have, many colleges now have a network where they can text students, faculty and staff to alert them and give them direction, such as shelter, shelter in place and they can keep them informed as the situation involves using that emergency channel. So what you're telling us is that first you, you have to have a clear understanding of what channels are available both internally and in reaching external audiences. So a, a clear sense of what do we have available that we can deploy and um, you know, you make a great point about not necessarily trying out a new communication technology when you really have to make, be really focused on the stakeholders and the message. Uh, I think that's really good advice. I'll also suggest that, you know, when we talked about stakeholder analysis in module two, one of the things we were thinking about there when we kind of go through what are the key audiences, groups of people that we might want to communicate with or may need to communicate with, having a sense of what their communication preferences are so that we have a sense of, okay, if it's the media, this is the way we'll reach them. If it's a, the community, we're going to reach them through the police and fire departments, let's say. So we're not guessing. <laughs> we're not trying to improvise because as you know uh, during a crisis situation you have to be so focused and to have to improvise too much or to do guessing uh, it, it just it is going to is going to diminish the effectiveness of what you're trying to do so give us a, a lot to think about here uh, some rules of thumb in terms of delivery channels if we were to simplify, Carl, I think that um, in general terms, for most crisis situations, think about three main categories of, for responding. One would be the news media, as you were just referencing. Um, it's the news media's job when something goes wrong uh, and a crisis by definition fits, fits that category that they cover it. They'll be, all, they'll be all over it. And as you also mentioned, it's where people will naturally turn. They'll look to see what the local media is saying about it, the national media in some cases. Um, it's just a, a natural connection, a natural, natural information source. So keeping the media updated um, and sharing your messages with them is critically important. Second category is your own websites. And I use the term plural here because there's certainly the external website because if people say, ah, it, XYZ organization had um, a crisis event occur, they're gonna, they're gonna go to your website. So um, go, making that information prominent, 
um, in the short term using your homepage um, and, and perhaps banners or special sections can help flag that information. Longer term, um, creating special uh, pages where you're aggregating information related to the crisis is all in one place is important. Going back and mentioned websites, it's also important to keep your internal website updated so that your employees are informed and can uh, play that ambassador role that we talked about in the, in the previous module. So that's the second category, websites. And then the third category is, is social media. Uh, whatever channels your organization is active on, sharing the information to those channels, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, Inst Instagram, and the, the, the value there is um, reaching uh, an audience that prefers those channels, as you mentioned, um, but this all, and, and extending the reach and perhaps reinforcing people who are looking at multiple channels. So you're, they're seeing your message two and three times over. But just as importantly, social media provides a tracking mechanism or a monitoring mechanism mm -hmm. whereby what people may be saying uh, you can you can listen in on and if you see misinformation or you see misunderstanding you can jump on that and you can correct those misperceptions yeah, that, those are one, uh, terrific rules of thumb and you know I've noticed in looking at uh, organizational websites over the last two three four weeks almost all of the home pages have a, a COVID-19 message of some sort so Clearly, websites are places that a lot of visitors are, are checking out, and uh, it's very visible, and it, it needs to be reflect what's going on uh, in, in the particular situation the organization is facing. Do, you know, you've mentioned kind of channels that are not necessarily mass communication channels, but they're, they're, they're impersonal in a sense. What about face-to-face? -face? What about, you know, that more kind of direct communication? Is that ever valid to think about using that? It, it certainly is. And it's certainly a crisis, um, and particularly a large-scale crisis, requires uh, the type of broad-based communication, mass communication that we're talking about. Because you can get information out through the media, through web, through social, uh, broadly and widely. Uh, pretty quickly. So that, there's no doubt that that's important. But um, we should not overlook the value of that face-to-face -face and direct communication. Now, I'll give you an example to, uh, to illustrate this. In one of my previous jobs, I worked in an electric utility, and we had a major outage uh, at the start of one winter. Affected a quarter of a million customers uh, who were going to be without power um, it looked like for more than a week, between seven and, and 10 days. One of the steps we took was we held a daily conference, audio conference with uh, city and town officials from all the uh, cities and towns affected by, by the outage. And the purpose was twofold. One was they were a stakeholder group. They're an important audience uh, because they in turn were talking about what was going on and which leads to that second uh, purpose or second benefit, and it gave them talking points to go back to their constituents, the residents of their town, the residents of their city, and say, we just came from a briefing uh, with the utility. They told us to expect the following in terms of restoration steps uh, locally within the next 24, 48 hours. So it had that purpose of, one, we were saying to them, you're important enough, we want to talk to you daily, and it had the added benefit of they became a communications channel in and of themselves, reaching the broader audience, the uh, customers of the utility itself. Yeah, and you know, during this uh, entire program, you've been pulling some really interesting examples from the current uh, coronavirus uh, crisis that we're facing with respect to messages and channels. Uh, do you have a couple of examples you can share? Absolutely. The, um, uh, one, and you were sort of just um, going down this path, uh, is uh, Delta Airlines. Uh, they've established a special section on their website. Their business, as we all know, has been affected dramatically by, by what's happening. And they're getting, uh, no doubt, tons and tons of questions. So they've set up a special section on their website 
where whether you're a traveler, um, whether you're trying to uh, you know, get tickets refunded, whatever the question might be, um, you can get all that information very easily, very easy to find, and it's all, all in one place. So a good example, there are many out there um, happen to um, you know, focus in on, on Delta as one example. Um, going in a slightly different direction, another uh, example that I've pulled is from Northeastern itself. Um, within Northeastern, there's a center called the uh, Global Resilience Institute. Um, some of our uh, alumni may be, may be familiar with it. Its purpose is as defined in its name, it deals with community resiliency in dealing with difficult situations. Um, I, I think the pandemic fits with that definition pretty, pretty well. And true to its name, the Global Resilience Institute, um, fairly quickly after the, uh, the pandemic, after coronavirus became um, very much center in the news, put together a website and began promoting a website. It aggregated information from various sources with the core purpose of how to stay safe given the rise of, of, of this virus. And it's a great example of, of communicating consistent with your purpose. Again, in this case, community resiliency, but it also fits perfectly with Northeastern's broader mission of education and sharing information that's a benefit widely uh, beyond the, the borders of the campus. So I thought that was a good example of how, in some cases, crisis creates an opportunity to highlight what your mission is and what you're really good at. And the Global Resilience Institute has got, done a good job of that. I'll tell you what, Ed, thanks so much for uh, reviewing the whole notion of messaging and channels. What, what can folks look to in terms of the materials that are connected with this particular module? So to start, uh, Carl, there we have a slide deck with, uh, with notes that go into more detail um, on the topics of messaging and channels that we've, we've been discussing here. We've also included um, a couple of articles uh, one is on the, the message mapping that I was referencing before that uh, Dr. Cavello has, has created from the Risk Management Institute. Um, and the other comes um, from the Centers for Disease Control. It's um, a section of their communications uh, portion, their PR portion, that deals specifically with thinking about channels. So it ties in nicely with what we're, what we're talking about here. As we did in the first two um, modules, uh, we're including a, a case study, um, partly to show range, range of different types of, of crises that can occur. This one um, comes from a few years ago. Um, some of our uh, alumni may remember it. It deals with CarMax, and CarMax um, was facing a situation where the investigative TV program 2020 was looking into allegations of deceptive com customer practices. In this case study, uh, describes and defines in good detail how CarMax and its public relations agency went about um, uh, dealing with that crisis and responding to it and making sure CarMax was able to put its best foot forward and present its side of the story. So it's an, inter it's an interesting read. And then finally, um, there is, uh, as with the first two modules, there's a quiz wrapping up the content from this section and that ties into the digital badge that our participants can earn. And thanks very much, for uh, Ed, for that overview. And, you know, just in conclusion here, what we hope is that the material that we've assembled uh, in the three modules uh, provides you some insight, uh, whether you're directly involved with a particular crisis or not. Uh, we're all right now being uh, tremendously affected by a global crisis. And so what we hope is that this material and engaging with that material will kind of give you some insights. Uh, won't make you an expert in crisis communication, but it will give you some kind of key best practices, some key rules of thumb that can be applied to a big crisis or a small crisis. And, for better or for worse, every organization faces these over time. So this is, this is a case of being prepared and being attuned to what's going on and makes you a better judge 
of the crisis communication you receive if you are one of the stakeholders. So it isn't just sending communication, it's evaluating communication that you might be receiving. So thanks very much for your engagement with this program. And again, I hope there's some value and um, take care. Thank you. Thank you.